It's how do we miss that? Matt Taibbi oh. writes in response to this article, tireless busybodies again <clears throat> target Substack. So he's kind of on to the game. Mm. And Matt now says that Substack is under attack again. The crusade is led by a site contributor, Jonathan Katz, whose style might be characterized as embittered conventional, i.e. toting the same opinions as every mainstream editorialist, only angrier about it. There's been more of this genre mm. and of off on offer here as staff positions for talking point spouters dry up in legacy shops, but hey, it's a free country. If you want bringing about fascism, Tucker Carlson, Elon Musk, the leak, the lab leak theory and other hashtag resistance horrors you hear about. If you just left an NBC in a corner. Now this guy of course came back to that's not me at all. Or you feel deprived of headlines. Like quote, what Ron DeSantis and a Norwegian mass murderer have in common. Well, Substack's got you covered um, if you want anything more than that. But it's not Matt's idea of what alternative media is for, but fortunately nobody asked him, so why should he care what other people read? But Katz does, and that's the whole point. Jonathan Katz certainly does. I've even mixed it up with him a little bit. We're going to show you that. Though this site is a true content free-for-all, where you can find everything from serialized graphic novel novels, and there are great fiction writers on the on, on the platform, to Portuguese dark storytelling, to bagel bites recipes. I know you've been looking for those, Reef. Bagel right? bites. I of course. Who doesn't love bagel bites? It's it's a microcosm you know? of the old internet where the randomness and being able to hop from Bigfoot to Buddhism is a key part of the free vibe. And Katz believes he's detected a malicious pattern. And he aims to put a stop to it by deplatforming Substack contributors he doesn't like. Again, it's not necessarily deplatforming, it's demonetizing, but effectively, that's trying to do the same thing in the end. Same thing. Yeah. Group letter is being organized, demanding action. Following Katz's stern argument in the Atlantic, Substack has a Nazi problem. Now, I am not going to show this article. And the reason why is because A, the Atlantic is trash. B, I. Do not feature yes. corporate mainstream media on this show. I try to make it a point not to do that. And C, I'm certainly not going to give this guy any more light than uh, th than he than he ha he's already gotten for himself. However, Matt's saying that as an aside, and this is a big thing, that a big reason that the people read Substack is because of the terribleness of it. Magazines like The Atlantic, which is edited by a guy named Jeffrey Goldberg, who won a pile of awards for blowing the, we the weapons of mass destruction story in spectacular fashion for years on end, making him a walking, talking symbol of the failing upward dynamic in corporate media. He works, by the way, for Lauren Jobs. That's Steve Jobs' widow who bought the Atlantic and funds the entire operation. If that mm. magazine wants people to read Substack less, it might consider not filling its pages with exposés about the alpha server fantasies or plaintive defenses of the Steele dossier or other transparent propaganda instead of demanding deplatforming here. Again, demonetization. I'm going to, this was before the letter had come out. He says, like a prosecutor introducing an adverse witness early, Katz in his piece concedes a numerical observation in the, about the white supremacist problem on Substack, quote, these are, to be sure, a tiny fraction of the newsletters on a site that had more than 17,000 paid writers as of March, according to Axios, and has many other writers who don't charge for their work. We're talking probably more than 50,000 writers. He says, really, he should stop there, but of course he trudges forward. There are a whole 16 sites, he says. Now it's more than 16. That was anecdotal, and he said that's just where he searched, but 16 whole sites that deploy some variation of a swastika on Substack. And despite these being both legal and a complete non-factor in the national discussion, their existence cannot be tolerated. After explaining his real gripe, that Substack's leaders proudly disdain the content moderation methods that others' platforms employ, that comes to the moment inevitable in his humorously consistent genre of diatribe in which he threatens to pick up his substack ball and go home. Of course he does. So yeah. what what he says is that the question of what kind of community is a substack, substack is actively cultivating, how long will writers such as Barry Weiss, right. Patty Smith, and George Saunders, and for that matter, me, 
be uh, willing to stake uh, our reputations on and share a cut of our revenue with a company that can't Here's some advice. Me. Don't. Nazi flags count as hate. All those people uh, don't. Again, moving the goalpost, now saying that the company can't decide if Nazi flags count as hate speech. No, they do. However, I'm going to talk about why and why you can't kick them off because of that to begin with. Matt says, the first time someone tried this, Barry was on the other end of the dynamic, listed as one of the Substack evils, supposedly inspiring decent folk to leave. In March 2021, mm -hmm. Jude Ellison S. Doyle announced his their intention to walk out because Substack wouldn't kick the likes of Graham Linehan, author of the very funny Irish sitcom Father Ted, off the platform. The concept then was transphobia panic, i.e. Substack was a home to a burgeoning anti-trans movement spearheaded, Doyle claimed, by Linehan, and, and, well, there had to be a second really bad example. So Doyle somehow settled on Jesse Single, perhaps the single most inoffensive personality to have ever carried a New York Magazine byline. I wouldn't go that far, Matt. As I, opposed to Jesse Double. Well, Jesse Single is, I mean, he's relatively <laughs> harmless, yes. Nonetheless, Doyle identified the duo of Linehan and Single as harassment influencers, meaning those engaged in naming individual trans people who then got swarmed by their followers. Substack uh -huh. survived an exodus of about five writers in that episode. A year later, they went through another campaign, this one over the anti-vaccine sentiment threat, supposedly posed by Dr. Joseph Marcola and Steve Kirsch and Alex Berenson. Yeah. The legacy campaign mm -hmm. there gained steam when the mighty Center for Countering Digital Hate, the CCDH, claimed Substack was earning millions yep. from anti-vaccine content. The CCDH stat spurred more panic headlines in WAPO, The Guardian, New York Times, Vanity Fair, among others. Well, how dishonest were New York those Times. Stories? And how dishonest were these stories? Well, The Times was writing about growing pains on Substack and Mashable about its exodus of writers just after the company announced in late 2021 that it had passed the threshold of a million paying subscribers or quadruple the amount for the previous year. That number is now over 2 million, by the way, meaning that the community has again doubled in size since last year. Most corporate outlets would blood sacrifice half their staff for growing pains like that, okay? So let's start there. Now, yeah. what Jonathan has really been screeching about on notes is this, and ah. it's that um, Hamish McKenzie, who's the COO, interviewed for his podcast, a gentleman named Richard Hanani, who I'd never even heard of, but apparently he's got former white supremacist ties mm -hmm. and a background. Let's get back to this, yep. to Matt here. So this is why he's screaming about that they're amplifying and trying to promote white supremacy. This guy hasn't, I, I'm not a fan. He, I think he is a right winger, but he has reformed from whatever he says he was. I don't know if he has, but to them, Nazi. All right. But, in an age when censorship mm -hmm. and deamplification are big factors for journalists tempted to say something unpopular, cats tend destined to be eulogized as a parrot on the shoulder of received wisdom will not be sympathetic. Moving to a platform that's proven it won't buckle is crucial. People like Substack CEO Chris Best and co-founders Hamish McKenzie and Jirash Sethi have proven they won't let outside groups dictate to them about content. By the way, those, that's the three guys on the thumbnail with the Substack logo above them. That's Chris Hamish and Ziraj. I mean, uh, so far they've been so it's not pretty good. So it's not Weezer. It's not Weezer. I mean, look, I've I've had questions Damn. about all three of them at times, um, but <laughs> look, they're corporate bros and they're building a great platform. I would like them to stay out of, and that I actually agree with Jonathan Katz. Stay out of the promoting content pro content providers, uh, you know, and content mm -hmm. creators entirely, and be a platform. This is yep. why contributors like Matt, who have a lot to worry about on this front, are loyal. It's because they fight and won't let outside groups dictate to them about content. right? And they've proven that to Matt and to us. It's why people seek out content here. They know they're getting a far less filtered version of reality than they're seeing on platforms like Facebook and YouTube, where deamplification, strikes, and outright removals have become 
routine, right? Right. But what's the value add for Substack if they start bouncing sites at the behest of groups like the CCDH or the ADL or even writers at the Atlantic who have a pretty the, decent sized Substack? Or the CTI or well, the UTI. Well, no, or the SAN, which is the Substackers Against Nazis now. And we're going to, over 200 uh -huh. people have signed this letter and copy pasted it and sent it to all of their email subscriber base. The minute they take a step in that direction, the site just becomes a miniature version of the giant attitude grinding machines you find across the rest of social media from whence everyone fled here in the first place. Why does the world need another such platform? Of course, one could ask, why does anyone need Andon's Right Press? Which is one of the sites that draws yeah. that's drawn Katz's ire. And Katz go screams I mean, about how Matt irresponsibly links to a Nazi newspaper and helps them recruit and get more videos and more people because he's a right winger. Literally. Like that. So is Substack gonna be freedom of reach, not freedom of speech? Well, or, I, I certainly hope not. But or, I and certainly hope not see. But Okay. Um Yeah. One of the sites, so if one doesn't necessarily uh, think that anyone needs the and on Reich press, unless you believe in free speech culture, hate speech is not illegal in America for a variety of reasons that cats, who might someday enter into the Guinness Book for writing the most words about the ACLU's defense of neo-Nazis at Skokie without understanding the subject at all, doesn't see. The logic yep. of defending Nazi speech then and now is obvious and has nothing to do with indulging Nazis. David Goldberger led the ACLU's legal team in the Skokie case, and as he put it, quote, the power to censor Nazis yep. includes the power to censor protesters of all stripes and to prevent the press from publishing and embarrassing facts and criticism that government officials label as fake news. It's literally happening right fucking mm -hmm. now. Nearly 50 years later, this is exactly what we're seeing with the Twitter files, the CTI League, the Virality Project that Matt just wrote about, and innumerable other content moderation projects. They start off promising to stop clearly offensive or ridiculous posts like about microchips and vaccines. Yeah, so ridiculous there, right? Um, quickly, however, the purview expands to include anything that promotes hesitancy or contains anti-Ukraine narratives or too closely overlaps with the information ecosystem of, say, Russia or Palestine. This is how Stanford's Jay Bhattacharya. This is how Stanford's Jay Bhattacharya or the Green Party's Jill Stein end up deamplified on Twitter. Aaron, how Aaron Mate ends up on a list of accounts passed to the FBI by Ukrainian intelligence, and how guys like that end up on the Mayorovitz uh -huh. list. By the way, hmm. Yeah I, yeah, I just find it interesting that Matt chooses not to mention that. But I love Matt, and all props to him for, for being the biggest voice to stand up and punch back against this, this nonsense that's happening. Because we are under attack here as publishers on Substack by the people who are, who are legacy media and are, in my opinion, invading this platform. And they are guests here. We built this. This is our home. I have over 12, almost 1,200 published posts in the last three years on this platform. And I don't really want somebody coming in here and telling me what I can, can't publish or that I can't be monetized because they don't like something that I've published. And I am, look, when it comes to Nord Stream, right. when it comes to all these things, I challenge narratives and I publish people and I republish people to challenge narratives. This is nonsense, right? Right. So where do these people come from and how do they how do they come to be so entitled? Their parents still doing their laundry. It's amazing in addition to being infuriating, right? So Matt writes his his rebuttal, which I think is great. 